All right, we want to say good morning to everyone, and greetings, and thank you all for um, joining us for this broadcast, and we pray that uh, something will be said that can be a uh, blessing to you. Of course, my name is Brother Hulk Bolden, and uh, we're actually, as you can see, we're not uh, in the sanctuary this morning, but um, we're still coming to you in the name of the Lord, and um, we're always grateful to be able to share the things that God has laid on our hearts to share, and we sincerely hope that uh, you will give heed to the things that God says, because uh, God's word is food for us, and it's what we're supposed to live by. Jesus Christ said that in his prayer uh, model to give us this day our daily bread. That means every day, just like we eat regular natural food, uh, we should be chewing on spiritual food as well. And it may not be the same thing every single day, but it should be something that feeds us. And if, of course, if you know anything about food, it's to nourish us and it's to help us to grow and to give us strength. And that is one of the things that God uses His Word for, not only to help us to grow, um, but to give us uh, strength. Um, and and uh, that's the way we're to look at it. When we don't eat on God's Word on a daily basis, then we're not strong enough a lot of times to withstand the tricks and the enemy, the tricks that the enemy has uh, has cooked up for us uh, to cause us to stumble. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up with a word of prayer now. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity that we have, Lord, to discuss your word and to come be before your people, Lord. And we ask that you will speak to us plainly. We ask that you will be glorified, Lord, and that lives will be changed. I pray right now that you will prepare the hearts of the people. I ask, Lord, that you will remove all distraction that will cause people to uh, be distracted. I ask, Lord, that you will help us all to focus in on the things that you have to say to us on this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, there have been many times in, in, uh, in the ministry where we have spoken on different things especially concerning uh, healing and deliverance and in actuality those things go hand in hand healing and deliverance and um, God has has uh, had us to speak on that on several occasions just mentioning it here and there but of course now we've started a series on uh, on healing and deliverance on healing especially and um, there are a lot of things that God wants us to understand about it before uh, we actually try to go out and and uh, minister to to others, minister healing to them. And um, one of the things, of course, as we've talked about in the previous uh, part of this series, is that healing is a gift, and, and uh, it's one of the many gifts, and uh, it is something that is given by God, uh, and and there and everyone does not have that that gift of healing you see everyone does not have it amen and so if you have your Bibles let's go to the 16th chapter of the book of Mark and we're going to um, just bring out something just really briefly uh, the 16th chapter of the book of Mark and uh, we will start reading uh, at verse 15 it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Verse 19, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs and wonders. You see. And so that's one of the things that God used uh, healing for, was to confirm his word with signs and wonders. Now, of course, of course the word signs, 
uh, it's talking about uh, something that's signifying something else. It represents something else. And a lot of times God used healing to signify that he was with the person that was doing the healing. And so most of the time when somebody have the gift of healing, they also have the word of God to, to, that, that needs to be confirmed. The Bible says that God worked with them and confirmed his word. Now one of the ways he confirmed his word was with the gift of healing. You see that it was with the gift of healing. So let's go now. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the uh, book of First Kings, and uh, we're going to point out something in this in this latter part of this scripture. This, the uh, the book of First Kings. I want to say is the seventeenth chapter. Yep, the seventeenth chapter of the book of First Kings. Now, of course, in this particular story here. Uh, we're going to be looking at a man, a man, a prophet named Elijah. Of course, you know that uh, the Word of God says that Elijah prayed uh, earnestly that it would not rain, and uh, so God withheld the rain. And then he prayed again that it would rain, and it rained. And uh, so while this famine is going on, uh, God tells him to go to this brook where the ravens would feed him, and he goes to this brook, but then the brook was dried up. And send the, so then God sent him to a widow woman. And this widow woman, uh, basically he told Elijah that this widow woman would take care of you. He said, I have commanded this widow woman to sustain you or to look after you and take care of you. And so he goes there and she, because of her obedience, she's not affected by the famine as other, as other people are in that day. Uh, she is... Uh, receives a miracle where all the all never fails and she's constantly have food and in fact in the 17th chapter of the book of first kings the 16th verse it says uh well we'll start reading in the 15th verse it says and she went and did according to the saying of elijah and she and he and her house did eat many days you see verse 16 it says and the barrel of meal wasted not neither did the cruise of all fail according to the word of the lord which he spake by Elijah. So that means that they constantly had food in the barrel and all in another barrel. So none of those things failed. In other words, those things were being multiplied. When they went to get food one day and it maybe had emptied it out, uh, the next day when it was time to eat again, uh, more food was there. The next time that they were, it was time for them to eat, more food was there. And so that's how um, God operated in her obedience. All right. So now we'll start reading at verse 17. It says, And it came to pass after these things, that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. So, one thing we have to understand about healing and about situations that we may find ourselves in, this woman was being obedient to God. Uh, she was taken, she took the word of this prophet, and had solved the miracles of God, but her son fell sick, and so much so that he basically what it's saying that he he died. You see, now a lot of times we think, especially as believers, and we think, you know, people think that because they're being obedient to God, and because um, they're walking in God's divine purpose for their lives, that nothing is ever supposed to happen. Nothing is supposed to go wrong. And if we're not careful, especially when you're talking about divine healing and how God operates, a lot of times God allows things to show signs. Many times, again, people want miracles without actually needing a miracle. So, why, what is it, how do you know that God is stepping in if there's no reason for Him to step in to begin with? And so, a lot of times people get caught off guard and they begin to question God. Now, let's read verse 18. It says, And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Now, notice what her mindset was. Immediately, she began to check herself about some past sin that maybe she didn't repent of or whatever the case may be. She immediately went back to what she had done in her past and thought 
my son dying is a result of what I've done. Now, when you're talking about divine healing, it's important that you see the big picture. Now, regardless, it may have it may be somebody's sin that have brought about whatever it may be in their lives that's not going well. You see? It may be somebody's sin. But if ultimately the goal is for them to be healed. So it may require you saying, Yes, you've sinned or you've done this or you know, like what Jesus told uh his disciples about the man that was born blind. It wasn't anything that he had done. It wasn't anything that his parents did. This was just so that the the power of God could be made manifest, so that God could be glorified. And I think it's very important that before we go into a situation where, you know, with the gift of healing, that we understand what is going on with that, you see. Moses, for example, when his sister and brother, Miriam and Aaron spoke against him. Uh, the Bible says that God struck Miriam with leprosy. And when Moses prayed for her, God said, If her father had but spit in her face, shouldn't she be outside of the camp? For, uh, you know, shouldn't she be isolated and outside of the camp? In other words, I'm going to allow this, and this is the reason for it, you see. So, yes, God brought healing. Uh, but Moses had to understand the reason for it. And a lot of times, if you don't deal with the cause of something, there's no way you can e effect change in a person's life. You see, in other words, when God, when Moses went to pray for Miriam, God made it clear she has to pay for what she did. Mm -hmm. Now, healing came seven days later, but Moses had to understand your prayer is not going to get past God's divine purpose for it, God's divine reasoning for it. In other words, you it would, wouldn't have done Moses any good to pray for his sister without knowing what got her in that situation to begin with. And so this woman, she's doing a, a self-evaluation. Now, it's important also that we don't accuse people uh, without knowing all of the facts. It's important that we don't go there with uh, a spirit to uh, accuse people and just point out sin, but the purpose is to to bring about healing. You see, uh, if you remember when Job when when Job was struck with the sicknesses, the disease that he had in his body, and all of those things happened, him and his friends spent <laughs> no matter how, no no telling how long trying to figure out mm -hmm. what was it that got me in this situation. You see that? And so his friends were accusing him. Well, you had to get out of the will of God some kind of way because God is righteous and he wouldn't allow this to happen. And so many times uh, it is important for us, I'm talking about as ministers that have the gift of healing, to understand what is the reason behind it. That's the reason why Jesus Christ made sure that his disciples knew this man isn't blind because of anything he's done or anything that his parents have done, but that the works of God may be made manifest in his life. You see that? And so, God, the Lord didn't say, well, it's not, it's not in any of your business why he's that way. Just know I'm going to heal him. Mm -hmm. You see? Now, why should we understand what we're going into before we uh, pray for a particular person? Because if God have struck something or put something on somebody or if someone have something on them as a result of sin, you praying about it, what you're actually doing is putting yourself in a position where you're going against God. You see that? And, and that's why God had to correct Moses in that. If her father had but spit in her face, should not she be outside of the camp for seven days? In other words, Moses, regardless of how righteous you are with me, you doing what you're doing is in essence going against my divine will. And so a lot of times we can get ourselves in trouble by trying to take something off of somebody before time or before what what actually uh, the, the cause of it is realized. Many people are walking around sick and don't even know why they're sick. You know, and I understand that, you know, sometimes folks have a problem with this kind of teaching. But even in the, in the New Testament, Paul talks about many people are sick and sleep because they've taken taking communion, you see, uh, and without discerning the Lord's body. In other words, un, um, 
they're not living a holy life. Mm -hmm. They're trying to be partakers of something that's holy without themselves being holy. You see? And so he said that many people are sick and sleep. In other words, dead. And have died. In other words, died from sickness. Because of them not discerning the Lord's body. You see that? And, and so it's important. Now think about that. Many people are sick. That don't, and and I, I can guarantee you that there were ministers to go pray for these sick people. But if sin wasn't called out, that caused them to, the thing in their life wasn't called out, that caused them to be in that condition, they're in trouble. You see that? They're in trouble. Not only is the person in trouble that have that, but the person that's trying to lift that off of them. So it's important that we ask God for uh, discernment of, about what we're getting ourselves into so that we don't find ourselves on the wrong end of something, you see. Now let me make this clear since we're saying all of this. God wants to heal everybody. It, God, it is not God's will for anybody to be sick, for anybody to go through that. But you know what happens? Sometimes people open up the doors for the enemy to come in and attack them. So everybody is sick. It's not because God has struck them down. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a child. You can tell a child, don't get out there in that road and play. Don't play in the road. And if they be disobedient, they're opening themselves up. Not for mom and daddy to run them over with a car, but for somebody else. So it's not always God that strikes people. When you get outside of God's boundaries, in other words, outside of that fence that he's laid around you, then you're on your own. And the enemy can do what he want to do. Now you're in his territory. Amen. Now, you have to make it clear. We've talked about in the past how when the enemy comes against us as believers, he's trespassing. But you know what? When we get outside of God's will, well, there is no, 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 no such thing as land that's not owned. So when you get off of God's property, whose property are you on? <laughs> Amen. So when you get on that property, now you're trespassing. And he has a right to do what he want to do with you after you get off of God's property, you see. And so a lot of, and it's important that we understand what role a person have played to get themselves in a position, if any role. Now we shouldn't, and that's another thing we want to point out, we should not assume uh, anything before going into a situation. We have to pray and ask God to reveal to us. And when God revealed it to us, we have to stand on what that situation, what we understand about it. Mm -hmm. And not be afraid to bring it to them. That's right. You see, not be afraid. All right. Verse 18, we'll read that again. It says, And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Are thou not come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Verse 19, And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom, and carried him up into a loft where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed. You see that? And he cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? So he's appealing to God. He's standing in the gap for this, this woman. You see that, and basically, look at what look at what he says there. And he cried unto the Lord and said, "O Lord, my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn? In other words, with whom I'm living. In other words, what he's doing is showing, bringing to the Lord, this woman is looking after me. Mm -hmm. And are you bringing evil? In other, are you bringing evil?" unto her by slaying her son you see that let's keep reading verse 21 it says and he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said O Lord my God I pray thee let this child's soul come into him again now of course the Bible doesn't say how long this prayer was but it wasn't just okay Lord help this child raise this child from the dead it says that he stretched himself up on that child three times. Mm -hmm. Well, that means that he had to lay down on that child, and then he got up, and he probably walked around praying, and then he laid back down on the child. So we're, we're, we're talking about a, a, a spiritual battle going on here, where he's crying out for this child's life. And one of the things we have to realize when we're praying for people, 
we're in a tug of war. Sometimes that devil don't want to let up. Now, what was the purpose of this happening to this child? Not only to confirm God's word, but part of it, let's think about it. If this was an attack of the enemy, this would have discouraged this woman, this widow. Why? Because she could have had the mindset, I've been taking care of this prophet. I've been obedient to God's word, and this is what I get. My child gets killed or slain because of it. You see that? Is this the payment for obedience to the Lord? Mm -hmm. And so we have to, as ministers, stand in a gap for people and realize, especially if the devil is behind it, you see, we have to uh, stand in a gap for people and, and realize it's not going to happen all the time at the snap of a finger. That mm -hmm. Sometimes that devil don't want to let go of what he's got a hold of. And, and if we are not willing to stand in a gap for people and pray in the manner that Elijah prayed, then people will be lost. People will be sick. People will go through things that they don't have to go through simply because we have something else to do. Right. You see, and again, God want us, you know, us to, he want us to stand in a gap for people. If it's not, Lord, heal this person, it maybe is God show this person and change their heart. That's, you know, so that they don't find themselves in a condition, this condition again. That's why Jesus spoke to one uh, man that he had healed. He said, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. In other words, I, you got your healing. But don't you go out and do again what you did to get yourself back into the same shape. Because what happens is you end up worse than what you what you would have, uh, what you originally, the situation that you were in originally, you see that, and that's why we, the ministers that have the gift of healing, we have to walk in wisdom, because uh, some people want to, people want to be healed, but they don't want to be delivered. They want to be healed a lot of times, but they don't want to be delivered from the sin that have gotten them in that place to begin with. And you have that's why the whole counsel of God have to be preached so that that person the next time you see them, they ain't, they're not worse off than what they were. The first time you pray for him, you see that. All right, so let's keep reading here. Verse 22, it says, And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. You see that? So God heard uh, Elijah's voice. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of James that Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly, and God heard his prayer. You see, and we have to know, we have to be sure, you see, that when we're praying for sick people to be healed, that God is hearing our prayer. And I believe that we ought to get an answer one way or another. Mm -hmm. Amen. God, if God don't, if God don't confirm, I'm going to heal them, he ought to, he ought to confirm, no I'm not, because this is in their life. And then our next prayer should be, okay, Lord, what part am I to play in getting this person restored back in the fellowship with you so that they can enjoy the benefits of having a relationship with you? Amen. You see that? See, we have to be concerned with the whole being. Uh, sickness and things like that is oftentimes a manifestation. Physical sickness is oftentimes a manifestation of a spiritual sickness, of something spiritual that's going on. And we have to be willing to deal with the spiritual side, not just say, okay, I want you healed physically, but spiritually your soul is on its way to hell. That's the reason why Paul said in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians, concerning the man that was sleeping with his own uh, stepmother, turn, he told the church, turn that man over to Satan to be buffeted, by the, uh, to be buffeted in the flesh so that his soul will be saved in the end. In other words, allow Satan to get a hold of him. That will make him cry out for repentance. And you know what? In the second book that he wrote, in the second epistle that he wrote to, uh, to the Corinthian church, the man repented. You see that? And a lot of times people don't repent because the church is trying to cater to them and trying to you know, keep them coming to church instead of doing what Paul tells us to do, doing what the Word tells us to do. When folks want to hold on to sin, you don't allow them to keep coming to your congregation because it's clear they're not coming there to have a relationship with God. Mm. Amen. You see that? And so we have to turn people over to the devil. To allow the devil to buffet them. 
In other words, we, to allow Satan to chase them. And what happens is that they end up coming back to the Lord a lot of times if they don't get more hard-hearted, you see that. But as long as we, the church, are catering to people in their sin and just saying, well, I accept you and I, you know, I love you the way you are and, and, and all of these cliches that we have going, what is the motive for people even turning you know, to the Lord Amen. if God just accept them in their sin? God will right. never accept sin. Amen. He will never accept sin. And unfortunately, we got a whole church world full of sick people that are that way because the church is not doing their job and realizing, hey, there's something going on here. Now, to me, if you got enough sense when you get sick to go to the hospital or go to the doctor to see what's going on, you ought to have enough sense to go to God and say, God, what's going on with me spiritually? I see what's going on physically, but is this a manifestation of something that's wrong in the spiritual realm? Have I opened the door for this to come on me? We got enough sense to know, okay, something is wrong naturally. I don't feel good. I got a headache or I got a headache that won't go away. Or, you know, I feel like my chest is, is hurting real bad. Now, if we got enough sense to go to a man, a doctor, mm -hmm. who really don't know about the body, went to school to learn how everything is connected, but that's about as far as they go. Because in reality, no doctor can heal you. If we got enough sense to go to man who didn't design the body, why don't we have enough sense to go to God who designed it, who knows everything and how it's working and Amen. what the spiritual cause of these things are. That's right. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 22, we'll read that again. It says, And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. Now, you know, I, I can remember over the years uh, watching different, I guess, TV shows where uh, I think it was a, a show called Emergency 911 or 911 where uh, 911 calls were made and the camera crew, crew would follow the ambulance or whatever and a lot of times people would be revived, revived and I would see how a person would be what they call clinically dead when they arrived at the scene and you may have somebody who's passionate about bringing this person back to life and so they'll do CPR for 10 minutes And the person will come back. And then I've seen where somebody go out and they're clinically dead. And they may try it for a minute or two and just pronounce them dead. And you know what? They'll stay dead. And I've always wondered, why didn't they keep going? Like, why don't they just keep trying until, you know, they see something? Like, right. what, what makes this person different from this person? One minute on this person versus ten minutes on that person. It was somebody's compassion for that person. And, and that's what we see here is Elijah's compassion that he stretched himself out on this boy three different times. And the Bible says, and God heard his prayer. Now, what would have happened if Elijah, after the first time stretching himself out, you know, said, well, I guess that's it. God took him and he's not coming back. You see. And, and, and we have to think about that in our own lives. How many times have we shortchanged God and not followed through in prayer for someone else and they suffered because of our own lack of compassion towards them. You see that? Alright, let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 23 says, And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Now, there are several things we want to point out here. Notice that after God did the miracles with the cruise of all and the and the, bar, the the meal there, the food, in other words, she didn't say, "Oh, I know you're a man of God now because my food isn't running out and my cruise of all isn't running out, so I'm constantly in abundance." And many people today in the church that would be enough for them for their material possessions to be mm -hmm. constantly replenished now let me make this clear could it be that this woman understood in her day that the devil could do miracles as well that you see when Moses went down into Egypt 
those Egyptians weren't impressed by him throwing his rod on the ground and then turning into a snake. They could do the same thing. Now, I'm not saying that we should not believe God with every sign that he shows us. But what I'm saying is we have to be careful that we're not falling for the okie doke from the devil because he's imitating God through miracles. Look at what this woman said. This, and the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God. Why? Because a healing took place. The devil would never raise anybody from the dead because life isn't his to give. Amen. He will never heal anybody because he doesn't have healing on in him to begin with. You see that? Yeah. And that's why this woman said, By this I know. Why? Because you've heard us say before, the devil will never heal. He can imitate other gifts, but healing is the gift that he cannot imitate. You see that? Look at how she said it. Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. Now why did she stop and say, why did she say that the word, that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth? She said that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. In other words, you're not just preaching but you're preaching truth mm -hmm. many preachers get up every Sunday they read the Bible that's the word of the Lord but you know what you can take God's word and twist it and turn it into what you want to turn it into see that's one reason why and why God doesn't confirm his word through every preacher because not every preacher is preaching the truth you see Notice, most of the time when you see God's word, you'll see word of truth. That means that, I, in other words, I can read the scriptures, and the way God explains it, it becomes truth by what he says about it. Not through opinions, not through tradition, not through what was learned in theology school. The Pharisees, they had the word of God, and they taught it, but they didn't teach it in truth because there was no truth in them to begin with they didn't have a relationship with God they taught the letter of it you see right. and whenever you get into teaching the letter you gonna you got room for error mm -hmm. the Bible says that the that that the letter killeth but the spirit is what maketh alive it's the spirit of God that teaches his word and that makes it true and that's the only thing that God is going to confirm with healing with signs and wonders is is his truth his word being preached through truth Amen. And so that is what God wants us to understand about, about divine healing. You see, that is one of the things that God wants us to get about, uh, about divine healing. It's also used to confirm His Word. Amen. All right, Amen. let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your Word. We thank you for the things that you've said to us, Lord. And we pray for everyone that is listening in. We ask that you will strengthen them in your word, Lord. If there's anyone, Lord, who's who uh, have heard this word, Lord, who may have had doubt about healing and about whether or not it was your uh, will to heal them, Lord, we pray that that doubt have been removed, Lord, that they will seek you wholeheartedly concerning the thing that may be bothering them in their body. Lord, I pray that you will give us all a compassion for souls first, Lord, and realize that healing is a byproduct of our salvation, that it Amen. comes with what you've already done concerning our salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.